Good morning. My name is Alejandra Monge. I'm the executive director of the Corcoa Foundation in Costa Rica. And I'm very excited to be here during the 2021 virtual conference on improving tourism protected areas in a post COVID world. Um, and I'm really grateful with the Center for Protected um, Area Management from Colorado State University for having given me the opportunity to participate on this um, conference. Uh, my presentation is about regenerative agriculture, promoting the sustainable use of natural resources to preserve, to preserve protected areas. Um, and uh, first of all, I wanna give you a little bit of context of uh, where we are in, um, in the country. Costa Rica is uh, one of the oldest democracies in the world. Uh, we haven't had an army since 1948. Uh, which kind of allowed us to invest a lot in education and health. So it's a country that, um, although it's still a poor country, uh, has very good indicators of health and longevity. <clears throat> and regarding biodiversity, well, the country has only about 0.03% of the land mass. It contains 5% of the world's uh, biodiversity. And to do that, and to protect this, Costa Rica has invested a lot of money in um, protected areas. So around 25% of the country has uh, some sort of national park reserve, so some, some sort of management um, to protect it. Uh, Costa Rica is one of the most mega diverse countries in the world. The Osa Peninsula alone hosts 50% of the biodiversity in Costa Rica and 2.5 of the world's biodiversity. Um, this, the southern region stretches from the Talamanca mountain range to the Pacific coast and includes an array of national parks, uh, beautiful biodiversity, fragile ecosystems. Um, and as I said, more than 50% of the biodiversity of the country is in this area. However, the Osa Peninsula is also one of the poorest areas in the country. Unfortunately, the communities surrounding these protected areas are also some of the poorest populations in the country. Uh, it's like we have two Costa Ricas, the Costa Rica that has all the education and the health and, the, and all those services, and the communities in the, in the coastal areas and rural areas that are very underserved. Um, the people in the Osa Peninsula, especially, they're very geographically isolated um, and they're very underserved by government agencies. They have very limited um, economically uh, feasible, feasible uh, opportunities. And ecotourism and community-based tourism started to create it to create a viable way of living um, in the last decade and a half. And it has motivated some of the local people to get involved in, a in economic activities, thus reducing their um, pressure on the natural resources. And, um, but then the pandemic hit and um, the health crisis caused by the COVID pandemic brought international tourism to an all time low. And the local communities uh, in Drake Bay became desperate. I mean, in other parts of the country, um, there were other sorts of income, but Drake Bay and um, the communities surrounding the Osa Peninsula had been depending on international tourism for um, 15 years. And 95% of the jobs depended on tourism. And then all of a sudden, Costa Rica closed its um, borders and um, many of the companies um, closed their, their operations. And so did the national parks. The national parks was, were closed and people started like, it, it was really hard because people, there was no money. Uh, there was a point where people would say there's no, no income whatsoever. So we started doing, um, we started uh, bringing food to the most, um, the elderly people and to the people that needed the most. But we also re realized that we needed to provide uh, um, a, a way to help to bring food to the, to, to, the, um, to the tables of these families because 
they were otherwise going to go back to hunt in uh, logging. So, as I said, communities had given up on agriculture. The farmers had used chemicals and slash and burn techniques for many decades to kill weeds uh, and er eradicate pests and fertilize their crops. And this has left their soils compacted, eroded, and sterile. Uh, <clears throat> and then low income farmers were increasingly trapped in a destructive cycle uh, dependent on exp expensive fertilizers and cutting and burning. And um, so that was, you know, they couldn't afford it anymore. And instead of like trying to fertilize the land, they would like keep cutting down the forest or burning down the forest to be able to open land uh, for their um, new crops. Um, so we figured out that we needed to provide a different option. And um, we realized that um, we realized that promoting tourism as the sole source of income made the communities vulnerable to this and to other crises. So we thought we need we need to provide other alternatives, uh, a way to um, diversify their uh, income um, portfolio, to put in a way. So we thought about regenerative agriculture because we thought this could help families alleviate the family's economic situation and reduce the pressure on natural resources and reduce the hunting on, and, and on wildlife. We started seeing as soon as the COVID hit and the people you know, lost their jobs an increase of uh, people going into the national park and um, hunting and logging and all this kind of thing. So we needed to do something fast to reduce the pressure of the communities in the national parks. So um, we started working to promote um, this concept of regenerative agriculture, which I think is very rich and it can be very complementary to community-based tourism and to other activities. So I wanna to talk to you guys a little bit about the concept of regenerative agriculture, because I think that's something that uh, it would be great to take home and start uh, experimenting with it um, and promoting. We are hoping that by, by talking about these things and the reason why I really wanted to be part of this uh, um, presentation today is because I, I, wanna, I wanna try to promote a change in the paradigm of how we produce food. Um, so regenerative agriculture is all about feeding the soil, not the plant. So it's not about putting fertilizers on the on the on the plants, but feeding the soil. Um, so we started uh, organizing permaculture and regenerative agriculture uh, workshops to promote soil sufficiency and food independence. Um, to allow fa families to have the food needed for their uh, subsistence. Um, it, was, it was amazing uh, it, and it, it was really, really exciting. People loved the concept and, and, and you know, some of the, the uh, testimonies that we've got from the, from the families were that, you know, it happened in the best moment. They were, they were um, unemployed, desperate without um, sources of income. And this gave them like something to hope for. So regenerative agriculture is basically mimicking nature um, to rejuvenate the land. And um, the idea is to enhance the soil ability to capture and store carbon. So it has a big impact on climate change too, because instead of uh, letting carbon, um, back to the atmosphere, it stores it. Um, what they do is they strategically arrange plants so that they can grow and support each other. So families will learn that agrochemicals are not necessary. Uh, they're, they're fomenting changes changes so that they can produce uh, without, without having to pay for agrochemicals. Um, and so they're not using harmful, harmful chemicals that are bad for the water, that are bad for them, um, and that they're, they're bad for the ecosystems. And, and the other thing is that the families are seeing an improvement in the production. 
Uh, so the land that never produced before now all of a sudden is producing. And that it has been a huge uh, impact in their mindset, like the way they see these things. It's like it's changed a lot. Um, one thing that is really exciting is that 97% of the people that are working on this project is women with their kids. So it's amazing because it's going from, from cradle to table. Um, and they're also teaching their kids about how, where the food comes from. Um, so regenerative agriculture also helps community adapt better to climate change because um, the crops become um, more adaptable to weather um, by promoting the sun of uh, multiple crops, which promote biodiversity. They're promoting cover crops, which reduce erosion, and they're using compost fertilizers, which means um, circular economies because they're using this, the, the leftovers of their, uh, the waste of their um, farms to produce. And this reduces carbon dioxide, the, the footprint of the, of, the, of the crops by sequestering carbon. You guys know that traditional agriculture is one of the biggest source of um, carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, probably like 30% of, or something. Uh, so going back to regenerative agriculture can give an opportunity to also mitigate uh, climate change. And, and, and that's, this, is, this gives you like a little bit of an idea, like how one thing uh, is different to the other, like where uh, traditional culture compete with nature, uh, regenerative agriculture partners with nature. So this is a little bit like, to, this is something I found on the internet that it gives you like an idea, you know, like cover crops uh, protect CO2 in the, in the crops and protects water where the bare soil uh, uh, releases CO2 and of course uh, um, it, by evaporation releases water. And so at this point, we the foundation has trained 50 families and has provided them with the supplies needed to implement their activities. We realized that these people had no income whatsoever and that they were not gonna be able to um, buy plastic to make a cover for their um, for their orchards or um, maybe not even shovels or that kind of stuff. So uh, we provided with a, 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 with what it was like a virtual um, virtual slash um, in person activity where um, we would like do like some of the theory online and very specific, like this is how you work the this, this seeds and stuff like that. Um, but then we would do work in their homes and we would do small groups due to COVID, right? We couldn't have like very big groups. So we would have like small groups coming to uh, each family. So we would have the neighbors that are participating in the program too come to the family, help with their, with their uh, crops and learn a new technique. And then, and, then another and then another group would go to another house and do the same thing in, a, in another way, in another time. And the, and the wonderful thing about this is, is how that created a sense of community and of, um, of um, teamwork. And it was amazing to see all these women working together to share seeds, to plant their crops. And uh, what we are hoping at the end of this is that we're gonna be able to create a network of regenerative agriculture um, that can keep exchanging seeds, knowledge and promote also commercialization at some point. Uh, wonderful things that have happened with this is that for example, some of the people right now, some of these people have been working on this project for a um, year and a half and uh, they're producing their own food. They're producing a lot more variety of foods than what they had before. And some of them are selling their products in their own little uh, restaurants. When I started for a few years, I wanted to plant a little bit of the lot. I started with the seeds first because I didn't have any structure. 
cuando eso salió con la fundación, este, trabajar en huertas, entonces ellos nos donaron el, lo que es el plástico, entonces empezamos a hacer la estructura, la estructura y luego colocamos el plástico y ya tenemos sembrado rábanos, culantro, uh -huh. chile dulce, uh -huh. también hay culantro, coyote ahí. Uh -huh. Y por acá tenemos mostazas, mostazas, y acá tenemos unas lechugas, tengo semilleros de tomate, de ayotes, hay también berenjenas, unas zanahorias, hay este, espinacas, chiles dulces, más, wow, y pepinos, rico. jamaica. Y mm. todo esto lo usa en la alimentación de su familia. Sí, así es. Y antes de, de empezar con el proyecto, su, ¿tenía todos esos productos disponibles para la alimentación? ¿O es hasta ahora que los ha podido ingresar a, a ser parte de su, de su dieta? Sí, no, hasta ahora sí. Siempre ha sido como comprado. Ahora se, se uh -huh. produce acá. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. ¿Y cree que tiene más, es más beneficioso este tipo de, de productos sí, para claro tu familia? Sí, sí es, mucho más, es mucho mejor así que traerlo comprado. In conclusion, the Corcoa Foundation has been working for many years in strengthening the protected areas. We have invested in many years of environmental education and community development, and those have been great. But this pandemic gave us a huge uh, learning opportunity uh, that I think that is fundamental that we share. National parks have a very intimate relationship with their communities. Both education and economic development come hand in hand and are fundamental to guarantee the, protect, the protection of the natural resources inside and outside the protected areas. The second learning opportunity that we had with this pandemic was that relying on one economic activity only left communities vulnerable to crisis. Like this pandemic or like any other event that could come from climate change or any other uh, pandemic. Last, I believe that having been forced to learn to use virtual tools provided us with the opportunity of making learning um, more inclusive for women. Uh, the teaching format that we could that we chose helped uh, making sure that more women could participate since they could do it from home and they could learn while continue caring for the children. The results of this project have been more empowered women, more and better food on the table for 50 families, less carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, better agricultural techniques, and more resilience to climate change. Um, and I must say also better quality of water. I hope that this um, presentation is useful for you guys and I, Really appreciate the opportunity to talking to you a little bit about what we're doing. Thank you.